of additive volume. Hopefully by the end of this lesson, you will understand more about additive volume and how to find volume of irregular prisms. Today, we're gonna to cover two different problems. We'll go through them both together. And then afterwards, you'll be able to refer back to this video to help you with any practice problems throughout the week. Let's jump right in. We're gonna start by looking at our first problem. Barry is building a cabinet with the dimensions below. Find the volume of the cabinet. At this point in the video, I suggest that you have out a pencil and either the worksheet that this problem came from on Google Classroom if you can print it, and if not, just binder paper is okay. But every time um, we get to a stopping point in the video, you can pause and follow along on that binder paper. So pause the video now, go ahead and work out this problem, take about two minutes. If you get stumped or you finish early, come back and we'll go over it together. Hopefully you worked the problem out yourself. Now we're gonna go ahead and go over two pieces of work from two different scholars that tried to solve the same problem. What I want you to do is an error analysis. That means compare the work that you did to the work that you see here on the page and determine if you agree with scholar A on the left or scholar B on the right. Ask yourself, what did both of these scholars do and who solved correctly? Who do I agree with and why? When you have the answer to that question, you can unpause this video and come back and we'll see who's right. Go ahead and pause the video now. Take a minute to analyze the work. If you agreed with scholar B, then you are correct. Scholar A was incorrect and we're gonna take a closer look at both pieces of work to find out why. <clears throat> when we look at what scholar A did, we see here that they first wrote the volume formula, length times width times height equals volume. That's good. That's correct. But it doesn't look like they applied that formula. It looks like they have one, two, three, four, five dimensions when the formula for volume is only three. So it doesn't look like they actually applied the formula they wrote to begin with, which is why we could say that Scholar A's work was incorrect. When we take a look at Scholar B, we want to be thinking about what they did correctly to solve this problem so that we can take that away and be able to do it ourselves. Let's look at what Scholar B did. They have the same volume formula, I see, length times width times height, which is good. But it looks like they're finding the volume twice of a bottom and top prism. Let's look at the model for that a little more closely. In the problem, they have top prism and bottom prism. What they're referring to, what I highlighted here would be the top prism. And it looks like they annotated for dimensions of the top prism is four, five, and three. And dimensions of the bottom prism as 4.5, 10.5, and five. So it looks like they found the volume of both prisms, volume one and volume two, and then added them together when they were done. Which makes sense because we learned before that the formula for volume works only for rectangular prisms. At any point throughout the video, feel free to stop and jot this down, copy work that you needed to see if you didn't get it correct or vocabulary words that you didn't know. Moving back to what the scholar did, once they found the volume of both of these rectangular prisms, they added them together to find the total volume, which is the key point of today's lesson. In order to find the volume of irregular figures, here's our key idea. If a 3D figure is made of multiple rectangular prisms, like the one we just seen, we can add the volumes of each to find the total volume. Take a minute, pause the video, and write this key idea down. It's very important, and we're going to practice it again. We'll break apart number one a little more closely, and then we'll work on another practice one together. Before we move on, I want to come back to a side note. This is more of a video for another lesson, but some people might have been wondering, where did five come from in the dimensions of the top prism? So let's go back to our work in the model and point that out a little more closely because it wasn't evident, but it would be another key point. For prism B at the bottom, we had our length, width, and height. 
But for the top prism, we only had our length and our height and we were missing our width. The reason that that was noted as a five in Scholar B's work is because the two lines that I just marked are congruent, meaning that they're the opposite sides of a rectangle and they are the same length. So that scholar noted that since this is five, we already know that we can find the missing side lengths by assuming opposite congruent sides. That's where this five came from. Didn't want to excuse that, but it wasn't really relevant. That's a video for another lesson. Just wanted to address where it might have come from for anyone who had questions. So we're going to recap what those key strategies were that we went over in order to find volume correctly in Scholar B's work. And then we're going to dig apart exactly what they did again one more time. So step one, we crossed out Scholar A's work and said that it was incorrect. Now let's look at Scholar B's. First, they had to decompose or cut the figure into rectangular prisms, which they did in the model. Then they had to label the dimensions of each prism. So they decomposed here and they labeled length, width, and height, and length, width, and height of each prism. Steps one and two done. Third, they found the volume of each prism. The work was shown off to the side where they multiplied the length, width, and height to get these volumes. And then fourth, they added these two numbers together to get their total volume of 296.25 cubic units. Quick mathematician's tip, always make sure that your work is labeled, clear, and that you have units in your answer. We're gonna use these notes to apply this key point one more time and practice the concept of additive volume. And then you'll be ready to practice this concept on your own for the rest of the week, referring back to this video if you have questions. Problem two, pause the video, read it to yourself and take about two minutes to try and solve it using the notes you took from earlier in the video. Okay, welcome back. I hope that you had a chance to really annotate this problem for meaning and think about what they were asking you to do, as well as try to solve it using the strategies we learned before. We're gonna go ahead and do that together. Going back to our key point, that's a fine volume. All we have to do is decompose the two prisms, which is done for us here. That was step one, decompose. Step two was to label the length, the width, and the height of each prism. That information was given to us in the problem. So the length of the main tank was 60, the width was 20, and the height was 30. Now for the coral reef, the length was 60, the width was 10, and the height was 15. Now we're going to refer back to our notes. Hopefully you've jotted down that step one was to decompose, and then step two was to label the dimensions, which we've done. And we're going to go ahead and find the volume using the formula that we know, length times width times height equals volume. When we're done finding the volume of both prisms, we'll add them together to find our total. Let's go ahead and solve. Now we found the volume of both prisms by multiplying the length, width, and height. We will add these two numbers together to find our total volume and say that we are masters of additive volume after this is finished. Hopefully that answer aligns with the answer that you got. And if not, take a minute to pause this video, see what errors you made and correct them. And remember to go back and take notes just as I did to help you throughout the rest of the week with these problems similar.